Okay, so this video is all about nuclear power works, uh, both the radioactivity side, so the actual reactions, the nuclear reactions that are going on, and also the kind of the wider issues, such as how it works within a power station, advantages, disadvantages, why it's kind of such a controversial topic. So, the first thing we need to know about for nuclear power is this nuclear fission. Now, a few videos back, I talked about nuclear fusion, which is where I had two helium and hydrogen nucleuses even, and they were forced together and they joined together to make a helium nucleus, and they produced lots of energy. Now, for small nuclei, that's the way to go to make energy. You squeeze them together and you make them into a bigger one. Now, after a certain size of nucleus, and it's around about iron, what you need to do to get energy out of it then is you don't put two together, you don't put two big ones together and make an even larger one. You start to split the atoms up, and that's how nuclear fission works. So fission, unlike fusion, is splitting atoms, and it releases energy. So splitting atoms. Now, the one that we use in a nuclear power station is uh, the splitting of uranium. Okay, so you've probably heard of uranium. It's got symbol U, and then it's got a mass number of 235, and an atomic number of 92. So there's 92 protons in there, and there's 235 minus 92, which is about, let's try and make that really quickly in my head, 135, 143 neutrons in there. Okay, so this is uranium. I'll just write it out in full in case you need to know that, uranium. Now, we split uranium by firing a particle at it, and the particle we fire is a neutron. And we fire a neutron because neutrons, do remember, are neutral. So they're not going to be repelled away from the positive nucleus, because there's no, well, a neutral atom doesn't mind about positivity and negativity. So a neutron is fired at the uranium atom, and it's captured by it. And when it's captured, that makes the nucleus really unstable. And remember, radioactivity is just when an unstable nucleus tries to emit some energy by getting spitting out a particle. Now here, this unstable atom, it doesn't just spit out a particle, it breaks in half, okay? So this neutron's been um, absorbed, made this um, nucleus unstable, and now it's gonna spit it out by breaking apart. And it breaks apart into two new elements, and that is Kr, which is krypton, not kryptonite, as I always used to think. Now krypton has got 91 proton, um, and a mass number of 91, and it's got a proton number of 36. Now you don't really need to know these exact numbers, but it's useful to know that uranium splits into krypton, and then also Ba, which is barium. So, and barium has an atomic mass number of 142, and a proton number, or an atomic number, of 56. Okay? Now, you can see here, I've got three little things here. If we look at the um, the numbers, remember in our decay equations we had to have all these numbers adding up. Now, if you add up 91 and 142, you should get 235 plus a neutron, so 236. Obviously that sum isn't right. 91 plus 142 does not equal to 236. It equals to 233. And how we get rid of that, or how we sort that out, is that actually, apart from that neutron that was there, Another three neutrons are emitted here. So when a neutron um, bashes into a uranium atom, makes it unstable, it splits into two, and then it releases three more neutrons, and that includes this one here. Okay, so now if we add these up, 91 plus 142 plus three is equal to one plus 235. So that's basically 236 is equal to 236. So we can see that mass number is conserved, we say mass number conserved. Now the proton number is much easier because we don't have to worry about so much about that, the atomic number. Here we've got 92 because remember a neutron's got an atomic number of zero, so 92 equals 36 plus 56 and that's, as we can see, is right. Okay, so atomic number is conserved too. So exactly like those nuclear equations in the last video, we conserve all our numbers or we can say that the two sides are equal. Now the point of fusion is that it doesn't just produce some radioactive materials, it also produces energy. And exactly like before, exactly like in fission, no, not I should be saying fission, not fusion, exactly like in fusion, so fission produces energy, because exactly like in fusion, that's to do with E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light. And that's Einstein's fav famous equation. Now, if we remember, that mass came from a mass difference. And if I draw a line here down my arrow, 
like that. Now the mass on this side, the total mass I should say, the total mass of the neutron plus the uranium is not equal to the total mass of this side, of the krypton, the barium and the three neutrons here. It's a little bit bigger on this side than it is on this side. And that extra mass is converted into energy via E equals mc squared. So it's the difference in mass that means we get this um, release of energy. Now the final thing we need to know about the kind of process of fission is a bit more about these three neutrons here. Now there's three neutrons have been released. These neutrons, if you're in a, you don't usually just have one uranium atom on its own, you usually have a bunch of them. So these neutrons can then go on to cause other reactions, exactly like this one here, because it can cause other reactions. And we call this a chain reaction. It's a bit like if you knock over a domino in a line, not domino, sorry, chain, chain reaction, it's like if you knock down a line of dominoes, one reaction sets up the next, the next, the next. Now if this is uncontrolled, that's how you get an atomic bomb. So an uncontrolled chain reaction is an atomic bomb. But a controlled reaction, which is what we're going to talk about, is how you get nuclear power. So if you can control this chain reaction, we can get nuclear power. But this is the process of fission, and this is how nuclear power works. It can happen for other elements, but for nuclear power, we use uranium. Now, a nuclear power station looks something like this. It's not very exciting because it's all in black and white. I forgot about that when I printed it. But a nuclear power station works basically like any other power station except for one thing. So it works like any other thermal power station, we call them, except for one thing. And that's just how the water is heated. So in all power stations, in all thermal power stations, water is boiled in a boiler, okay? So this here is a boiler, and I'll talk about how it happens in a minute, but water is boiled in a boiler. The water turns into steam, so it's steam here, and it's forced around this pipe into this chamber. Now this chamber holds here a turbine, okay? And that turbine, like a wind turbine, it's basically the same thing, is spun around by the steam. So the spin, steam forces the turbine to spin. Now the turbine is connected here to a generator. And if you can't remember how EM induction works, you need to look back at P5. But a generator generates electricity because inside this, there's a magnet and a coil of wire. And if that magnet turns inside a coil of wire, it produces an electric current. Okay? That's all, that's the only thing you need to know. It's just a magnet turning in a coil of wire produces an alternating electric current. And that current is then passed on. It's connected up, I'm going to use a different colour than orange. It's connected up here to the national grid. And the national grid is basically the system of pylons and wires and transformers and people in charge of it who make sure that the electricity gets from the power stations to your home. Because remember, like your home is probably quite a few miles away from a power station, so there needs to be a way to get there. Okay, so this, is the, this part of a power station is the same wherever you are. It's this bit that's a little bit different in nuclear power. Now normally you'd just have, below the boiler, you'd be burning a load of coal or a load of gas. But here, we've got a nuclear reactor doing that job for us. Because remember, fission, we looked at it here, produces energy. And this energy can be used to heat water. So, this here, this round thing here, this is the nuclear reactor. Okay? Which sounds scary, but it's not. So this is the nuclear reactor. Now, in a nuclear reactor, we have some nuclear fuel in fuel rods. So here, in this square, you'd actually, if you looked at it close up, you'd see lots of kind of circles like this. And each of these circles is a fuel rod. So these are fuel rods, and they contain what we say fissile material. So they contain uranium, basically. Contain fissile material, material that can be fissioned. Then, we also have something called a moderator and that's within the nuclear reactor so this bit here all here oh, surrounding it is a moderator now the moderator is usually something called heavy water which is just water that's about 15 percent heavier than normal water because it's got deuterium in instead of hydrogen and deuterium we talked about when we talked about fission fusion even i get so confused between those two words so a moderator it does two jobs this heavy water it transports the heat that is made from the fuel rods, because remember the fuel rods here, 
um, the fission is going to be happening here in these fuel rods. It transports the heat around here into the boiler, so we can then heat up the water, and then it comes back through the pump. You can see a pump there. It comes back around, back into the chamber. But it also slows neutrons down because these neutrons are moving really, really quickly. I'm going to go back onto the other piece of paper for a moment. So these neutrons. If they're moving too quickly, they'll just bounce off the uranium. They need to be moving kind of slowly to be captured. So the moderator makes sure that these neutrons that have been released are slowed down so that there's more chance of them being captured by uranium and starting a chain reaction. So they slow neutrons down to make reactions more likely. And finally, there's these things that are sticking up at the top. These here, these three rods. So there'll be more than these. There'll be thousands, of the, well not thousands, but hundreds of these in a nuclear power station. And these are called control rods. Now, control rods contain a material that absorbs neutrons. Okay, so control rods absorb, they don't slow them down, they absorb neutrons. It's usually um, made of boron. And what these do is that they slow down the reaction or they can stop it. So if the reaction is getting too much out of control, if there's too much fission happening, to control that chain reaction, we lower the control rods and that absorbs all the neutrons and stops the reaction. But also, these, new, these control rods are kind of, they can be moved up and down so that they can slow the reaction down instead of stopping it completely. So they can vary how much the control rods are in there. In the event of a disaster, um, like an earthquake or something, control rods are controlled by gravity. So there's nothing, if the electricity goes wrong, it doesn't matter. If anything shuts off, all that will happen is that the gravity will take over and those control rods will slam down and all those neutrons will be mopped up and the reaction will stop. So this is the way that they control the reaction. This is how they make it safe. So the control rods are all about safety. So that's the basics of how a nuclear power station works. So why use or why not use nuclear power? There's lots and lots of advantages and disadvantages for this. Okay, so the advantages, the main one that people talk about is no CO2 is produced. So no carbon dioxide is produced. And we know that that contributes to the greenhouse effect, which is not a good thing right now. Okay, because we've got too much of a greenhouse effect right now. So that's the main advantage, no CO2 is produced. It's also really reliable. It's efficient. So for one small pellet, which literally, if I hold my fingers up, it's about this big, of um, uranium gives you the same amount of heat energy as 800 kilograms of coal. So it's really efficient for how much fuel you have to use. That's because nuclear reactions are much, much more powerful and release much more energy than chemical reactions, and burning is a chemical reaction. Okay? It's sustainable. Now, it's not renewable because once you've used the uranium, it's used up. But because you use so little uranium and there's quite a lot of it around, it's sustainable for many, many years to come. Okay? So it can be. There's no problem with it running out like there is gas and oil. Also, we've got lots of safety precautions. So nowadays, like you've all heard of pr probably Chernobyl and that kind of problem, but nowadays, the safety precautions, such as those control rods controlled by gravity, are such that people kind of say they're fail-safe. Now, it's never a good thing to say that, because look at the Titanic, that was unsinkable. But 99% more than that, they're really, really safe nowadays. So there's lots of advantages to why we should use nuclear power. But obviously, for that, there must be some disadvantages, otherwise we'd be using it all the time. Now, the main one, is that radioactive waste is produced, okay? And now radioactive waste is not a nice thing. Now the actual amounts that are produced is quite small. Something like for each person, it's an egg cup full of really high level waste and a suitcase full of low level waste. But still, it is produced and we have to deal with that some way. And we're gonna talk about that on the next page. There's still the risk of accidents. So, you know, as we are saying, the Titanic did sink, even though it was meant to not be. Um, so the risk of accidents is still there. Like, look at Japan in the earthquake last year. The problem was it wasn't a nuclear reactor that went wrong. It was something to do with pressure. But there were still the worries that the nuclear power station was going to kind of blow. And then they're also really expensive to build and decommission. So although they're quite, I'll talk about, they're quite cheap to run. So let me just write this one down first. They're expensive to build and recommission. So when we build them, because they need a lot of safety precautions, they need a lot of money pumped into them. Then, once they're finished with, so about 25 years later, they can't be used for that long because they become too radioactive. So decommissioning means taking that apart and then getting rid of the waste safely. And that's really, really expensive. So overall, although the, the um, actual uranium is cheap, it's about the price. You get the same amount of heat for a pellet of uranium than you do for 800 kilograms, but a pellet of uranium costs about the same as 800 kilograms of coal. They're expensive to build and decommission.
So it's up to people to decide whether they think that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Personally, I'm on the pro-nuclear power side, but I'm quite laid back about, you know, nuclear accidents. So it's up to you what you believe. Now, we've talked about radioactive waste here. There's three types of radioactive waste. You need to know what it consists of and how it's stored. This is something you actually you do need to know for your exam. So, high-level waste, also known as HLW, because we don't like writing things out in full, apparently. So high-level waste, HLW. It consists of the spent fuel rods. And that means basically the fuel rods, once they've had most of their uranium used up. So spent fuel rods. It's stored underwater for about 10 years because it's so hot. So you need to cool it down. And it's really, really quite radioactive. It's quite dangerous to cool it down. Okay, so it's literally there's huge tanks of water in places like Sellafield, that radio at the um, nuclear power station in England, or one of them. There's huge, huge swimming pools or tanks of water you wouldn't want to swim in them, which this spent fuel rods are held in for a few years until they become the next thing, which is intermediate level waste, ILW. Okay, so that is old high level waste. So after about 10 years or so, because of nuclear half-lives and that kind of thing, the activity, if you don't know about half-lives, look at the last video, uh, the activity has reduced to a rate where it's a bit safer than it was, okay? This is the difficult one. We don't really know how to store this one properly. Right now, we've only got temporary measures. So temporary measure, but what happens is it's mixed with concrete, chopped up, mixed with concrete, and stored in... Um, sealed containers. Now we don't exactly know where to put this stuff, okay, so right now it's just in a temporary holding place. They're thinking about trying to uh, bury it in some old ga natural gas kind of caverns, or at least in America they are, but then we have the problem that in four or five thousand years time when people may not no longer speak English, or as the main language of the world kind of thing, or you know any languages that we speak now, because if we think about 5,000 years back, we don't really know any of the languages that were spoken then. Um, if, you know, we've evolved into a different kind of culture and civilization, and they dig and they find this nuclear waste, it's going to be really dangerous if they dig and open that up and we can't tell them, we, ha we can't just give them a warning sign, watch out, this is radioactive, because they might be able to understand that sign. So there's lots of kind of thinking about how that's going to work. The final one isn't so hard to... Uh, deal with. So this is low level waste, so LLW. And this is usually like workers uniforms or also things like medical tracers. So this is an exactly to do with them. Um... Oops, my video ran out of battery halfway through the last video. So just to really finish off quickly, as you can see I've written here, uh, for low level waste, that's mainly workers uniforms and medical tracers, things like that. However, how they deal with it, if they line a landfill site with kind of like basically plastic to make sure it's waterproof um, and then they just dump the waste in there and they know where it is so they can keep track of it but it just means that any of the radioactivity can't kind of seep through into the water supply and then kind of make the water radioactive which, which would obviously be really really quite bad for the environment and for general health okay so it's really important that you know about those three types of radioactive waste so that's nuclear power basically done all you need to know is what fission is how it works kind of the basic output of or the way that a nuclear power station works, some advantages and disadvantages, so reasons why or why we shouldn't use it, and then how they deal with radioactive waste and why it's dangerous. And it's dangerous because it's radioactive and it therefore can cause kind of, you know, it can emit beta, alpha and gamma radiation, it can cause things like ionisation, etc. I'm going to talk about how dangerous radioactive materials actually are in the next video, the final video of the topic. Hope that helped.